welcome to the CEC report. It's September 2nd and I'm Robert Barwick. I'm joined today again by CEC leader Craig Ishwood. Welcome Craig. Thanks Robbie. And we have a special guest today, the CEC's resident engineer, Jeremy Beck. Thanks Robbie. All right. The reason Jeremy's here today is because we're going to discuss a vision for the future, vacuum maglevs. We're also going to discuss anything is possible with the National Bank. And finally, what's that ticking sound? It's the property bomb. So first, a vision for the future, vacuum maglev. Jeremy is our resident engineer here in the CEC office. He also moonlights as the CEC state uh, chairman for Victoria. But this week, Jeremy, you wrote a release about something that would qualify as a productivity revolution for Australia's physical economy, a vacuum maglev railway network. Describe for our viewers how that would work. Well, it's a really exciting uh, technology. That It's not even new technology. Uh, we're using existing maglev technology, which China already has working right now. They have a train that goes from Shanghai to Pudong Airport. And That's you a put standard it, maglev. Yeah, and then you put it through a vacuum tube. And in a vacuum, there's no air. so because there's no air resistance, you can go incredibly fast. Now these trains can go at perhaps 6,000 kilometres an hour, or even faster. And uh, the Chinese have tested it right now, and they're looking at um, trains with a, a very long test track, you could go several thousand kilometres an hour. With a short test track, well, you know, it's, it can only reach about 1,000 k an hour. But if so you, you, need, you need the longest distances to get up speed. Exactly. About these kind of speeds. And over the Great Nullarbor Plain, you could literally get up to six and a half thousand kilometres an hour. Now, with the acceleration that, require, that, that is required to reach those speeds, would that be uncomfortable for passengers? Not at all, because we're talking about a, a very long way, a very big distance, and you'd be accelerating at a slower rate than you would be if, if you're travelling in an ordinary car but you're just constantly accelerating for about half an hour. Whereas in a car, if you go zero to 100, it only takes seconds. Right. Well, you'd be accelerating all the way to the halfway point and then decelerating the, the rest of it. Yeah, we could, in a country like Australia, if we build a network of these between all the major cities, mm. we're talking about cutting down travel times by enormous uh, amounts. Mm. Huge. I mean, we're talking about uh, going from one side of Australia to the other in perhaps less than an hour. And just going across Melbourne or Sydney or any capital city, just a matter of a few minutes. Um, this would also be applicable to undersea tunnels, I believe. That's exactly right. Uh, you could go to uh, New Guinea, Indonesia, Tasmania. Uh, amazing. Um, actually, there's been a proposal by two engineers. Uh, one of them is known as the, the father of the channel, that's the English Channel Tunnel. And uh, he, um, Dr. Um, Davidson, he's come up with a proposal to have a, a tube all the way under the Atlantic Ocean, which the, the train would go uh, at about 4,000 miles an hour, or 6,500 kilometres an hour, uh, and get from Europe to United States in about one hour. So just explain for the viewers, they, when you talk about a tube under the ocean, how would the physics of that work? What would they, how would they just, what do they propose to do, to make, how do they propose to make that? Well, the thing is you can't put it on the bottom of the ocean because the pressures are so enormous. So what you do is you have it neutrally buoyant around about 50 or 100 metres, not, not even 100 metres deep, and then you'd have cables that would go right down to the bottom of the ocean, which could be several kilometres down. And that fixes it there so that the tube won't somehow drift <laughs> somewhere right across the Atlantic Ocean. And then um, <coughs> the, um, the whole tube will be evacuated, no air in it, and you'd use existing maglev technology. So um, it would really be a huge revolution in transport. And because... Uh, uh, Australia is separated from the other continents by the
the enormous trench that it let lies between us and Indonesia, the Wallace Trench, um, and the, the depths of the ocean. Such things would be, like you couldn't do a, 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 an orthodox tunnel there, but this kind of tunnel arrangement, a floating tunnel, mm -hmm. like you're describing, is how we would connect to uh, ourselves with the whole world. The whole world could be linked this way. Exactly, and you just imagine perishable goods. Uh, it had just arrived in Asia in a matter of hours or less. Well, we'll talk about funding in a minute, uh, but let's talk about cost as a distinct issue to funding, and um, I'll be interested in what you say about this as well, Craig. Uh, there is a cost, but won't the physical cost of building something this significant in terms of manpower and materials be a boom for the economy, is one question. Mm. Second, on the other side of the ledger, aren't we talking about productivity gains of such a magnitude that any costs, actual costs become insignificant? Mm. Well, I'd, I don't even look at it in terms of cost. I look at it in terms of enormous savings, savings in time, and just a huge boom for the economy all around. And businesses will be able to communicate with each other. Say, a business in Perth and a business in Melbourne or Sydney could uh, meet with their, their colleagues right across the country and just hop on a, a train or actually, it doesn't have to be a train. Uh, there's a proposal to have little capsules so that it'd be just a car sized capsule. You just hop across the continent in about an hour. Uh, you could well, Sydney have goods. To Melbourne, Sydney to Melbourne, much less than an hour. Yeah, oh yeah, minutes. Yeah. Uh, and, and have goods. Uh, it could be a revolution, as was containerization for transport and cutting costs down. So uh, it would have an enormous um, benefit in economics. And this kind of revolution is what real productivity is. Well, yeah, I, when Jeremy um, was, we always have this debate because I always propose the existing maglev and then Jerry says, no, we should move to an evacuated tube. So we always have this debate, but he's correct because people, people watching this show, Robbie, might be saying, oh, you've got to be kidding. I mean, how could you possibly suggest such a thing? That's way off the planet. Well, let's put ourselves back to someone living in Melbourne, say, in the 1900s. And I've got a picture here because, you know, you take a picture of, say, this is actually Elizabeth Street and Flinders Street Station, right? Now take that gentleman there, for example. He's in the front forefront of the yeah, picture, right? Yeah. Think about what's in his head. Now, could he ever imagine, first of all, ever imagine a magnetic levitation train f literally flying across the ground as it does in Beijing at over 500 kilometres per hour? Right? How could, could he, wouldn't he say that would be totally ridiculous? How could you possibly suggest such a thing, right? Because you know, if you're just treating... Come back down to earth. That's come right. <laughs> exactly. Or, you know, we've been through the, the whole process of the last 110 years of seeing manned space flight, the whole, you know, the shuttle uh, programs and all sorts of amazing things, which, you know, in the minds of these people, you know, if you're thinking about it in a block sort of animalistic way, so that's completely impossible. However, if you look at it from the point of view of who actually uh, human beings are, that we have this uh, ability of making discoveries of the physical principles that allow these massive jumps in technology, then you say, well, look, the universe is, there's no limit in the universe. We can do anything we want. Mm. So then you come back to it and say, well, why, why can't we? Well, then this brings you back into the actual governing intentions of the world today, which is a monetarist system versus a system that actually supports a physical economy, which is what we're talking about here, of developing the technology necessary to transform the way that we live. So imagine going back to train transport in the 1900s, right, where the top speed of a locomotive, which was still, this was, you know, revolutionary technology that well, came that one, out. That's probably eight, oh, 1900. Okay. The 1900s, 1900, yeah. yeah. Um, you, this was the revolutionary technology in the period of Abraham Lincoln, you know, because sure. he had the establishment of the, uh, the great U.S. transcontinental railroad, where these, these, you know, iron workhorses literally opened up the, opened up the country. Right, but we're talking about um, an increase in productivity when you talk about higher speeds because the time it would take f just uh, for a train like this to travel across the US would be you know, days. This one would be hours. And the, the evacuated tube technology would be you know, possibly less than an hour, mm. minutes, you know, oh, yeah. and, you know, 59, 60 minutes or so forth. So you say, well, look at the value of the savings in time as a function of what 
other things those people can be involved in productively for the economy. That's where the real value to the economy comes in. And I haven't talked about money. Because no. money's an idiot. It's got nothing to do with it. The intention today that we have, and we've published a lot in our new, latest News Citizen about it, and uh, is that the, the ruling elites, the, fi the British uh, financial oligarchy, through the British Empire, want to reduce the world's population. They want to cut it down to less than a billion people. Therefore, we don't need technology. They don't want to invest in technology. That's their intention. However, we have, as you, you know, as you know, we have a completely different view as to how we should develop our physical economy. And to have evacuated um, you know, vacuum tubes all over this country would completely break down the tyranny of distance for our country. Absolutely. Um, I do want to talk about money for a second, but you should show the audience your, your other picture there because it shows you well, the reality of a lack of progress. <laughs> Well, I think these, this other picture, this is the first, we'll get, if we go back to the Flinders Street one, right, you, yeah. you can notice, right, there's no electricity poles. Electri electrification only took place, you know, you know, after this picture took place in 1900. Now, you, the first electricity uh, station was, I think, built in 1896, right? You don't have any cars. Cars weren't being mass produced until 1906. You have no bitumen on the roads, right? The, the um, um, you have the main form of, Transport is the horse-drawn carriage, right? And we go through all these different analogies because when you look at, you know, modern transport today, what do we have? We have, you know, electrified modern trams. We have the motor vehicle. We have the bitumen. Uh, we have different forms of construction. We have electrification. You just go through a time, uh, you go through all the different advances that you see in this photograph, and I've only just touched on the surface. Mm. It's all a result of the creativity, the development the, the, of, of the uh, discovery, the principles of how to make all this thing, these things happen. So take this photo, which is 2011, yep. and let's look in our mind to 2111, 100 years into the future. Now, if we have that view for developing our, uh, our economy, our you know, physical economy at the same rate at what's happened in the last 100 years, where would we be? And that's this question, you know, we, I think we'd be in uh, you know, vacuum tubes all over the country. Uh, and the world. And the world, uh, yes. I, I think by 100 years, we'd have a complete global network. I think we could have a, a pretty decent network even in the next 20 years. Well, but it must be invested in. So let's talk about money. The second item relating to this is uh, anything is possible with a national bank. So... Some readers of Jeremy's press release were provoked to say that we were ignoring the cost. It's a fancy idea that would be far too expensive. Um, however, when we in the CEC consider these issues, as we've just discussed, we do so from the standpoint of an understanding of what's known as national banking. Now, this year is the 100th anniversary of the establishment of Australia's national bank, the Commonwealth Bank by King O'Malley. Um, incidentally, one of its early funding achievements was the Indian Pacific Railway across the Nullarbor. And following on from what Craig said, arguably that project then would have been more of a challenge to our economy at that time than what we're talking about with the National Maglev, Vacuum Maglev Network today. So let's talk about how briefly Let's briefly talk about how national banking works. Craig, is there any limit to what's possible if we have national banking? The, the only limits you have with national banking come back to the physical economy, Robbie, because the, the, you do have limits. You have limits in manpower. You have limits in the availability of raw materials. So when you're looking at... But not money. Oh, I'm t I won't talk about money. Money's <laughs> an idiot. <laughs> it makes you stupid. I mean, the, the, the problem is if you start with an intention. There was an intention by King O'Malley to build a... Comp to the Continental Railway, the Indian Pacific Railroad, right? He said, we have to build this. He constructed a national bank in the form of the Commonwealth Bank. He fought for that, and that bank funded that intention, right? The money was not created as debt. It was created as credit. A very different idea than we have today, where we, we're a debt-ridden economy, where if we want to build anything, the question is, who's going to lend it to us? Well, the intention of the national bank is that you, you design what you want to do. Now, okay, we want to build an, a vacuum uh, tube, maglev, from Sydney, uh, from from Melbourne up, up through up through to Darwin, right? You say, okay, well, that's going to cost in real terms X amount of dollars. 
we will create the credit to do that. We'll set it out in stages and then we'll manage the development of that based upon the supply of labour and we've got all these boat people coming in, keep coming, you know, yeah. have them trained and placed in this sort of environment for, for real work. You make sure that you, uh, you, you fund their existence and their family's existence well, so you pay them high, highly uh, and look after them. You then, we have to nationalise the resources so that we actually have access to, you know, copious amounts of steel. Cheaply. Cheaply. I think these would be mm. steel evacuated tubes, wouldn't they? Yeah, for sure. Uh, these tubes would have to be fairly strong because you're talking about uh, resisting the, the atmospheric pressure and a vacuum zero pressure. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so you're going to have copious amounts of steel, which would then solve this question of, you know, make sure we have all the steel workers that are now being laid off, you know, put back into work immediately. See, the intention or the idea of us transforming the environment, the physical economy, therefore uh, governs what we do, not money. And that's, this is the big sticking point because we've had over three generations now of people that have been brainwashed into this British system of monetarism. Now this physical, uh, th this, sorry, this created credit is not inflationary because it's not willy-nilly, is it? It's you invest in things that increase productivity. Well, see, that's the argument that the, uh, the establishment, the British Empire's monetary system says, oh, if you just print money, it's going to be inflationary. No, it is not. By, by the way, the people who printed QE1, QE2 and QE3 say that too. Uh, yes, yeah, except they've, they've <laughs> created really hyperinflation of the, of the US dollar. That's why our dollar's through the roof. But the point is that if you manage the, uh, the, the, the credit issue based upon the physical development of what you're trying to do, you'll find you'll be able to produce an enormous amount of physical development before there's any hint but of potential of inflation. Now, if you, if you just <laughs> created the credit and stuck it in the economy for no benefit, like it's what they're doing now, yeah, yeah, sure. it will hyperinflate the the, uh, the currency, and you'll end up with a with a, with a big mess. So you have to manage this, just well, like it was done during World War Two by Curtin and Jiffley. Yeah. So the, right now, the Federal Reserve is printing money as QE two and QE three to lend to bankrupt banks to prop up their toxic assets. That's the definition of hyperinflationary. We're talking about creating credit that creates real, tangible, physical wealth. And take for example. In Australia, that we've got so-called a full employment problem, which is rubbish. Yeah. Take the amount of underemployment that we've got, people in jobs that they want to be in, part-time employment, and all these things, and then create you know, good high-paying jobs for people to get involved in this optimistic program. What happens then is the you, you end up with a you know, net increase of the taxable incomes. You end up with an increase uh, um, amount of money through taxes and so forth to be able to fund the economy you end up with an expanding economy. So even if you spend the money uh, as credit in the economy, what happens is your economy expands and absorbs the money that you've put into it. It's not a static arrangement. It's, you're, you're looking at the growth of the overall physical uh, pr productive output of the economy. And you'll find, like, if you take, for example, when they built the Sydney Harbour Bridge, I think it was they had to go to uh, John... Uh, they didn't have access to the Commonwealth Bank there for various reasons politically, so... Uh, um, Jack Lang went to England and borrowed $50 million to build the Sydney Harbour Bridge. $50 million to dollars today is a drop in the bucket. But if you didn't build that piece of infrastructure, what a mess Sydney would be in without the underground railroad, the, yep. the bridge, and, and the, the economic ex expansion potential of Sydney would have been dead. And that's what happened. Well, and the reason I brought this in, because the reason they didn't have access to the Commonwealth Bank, even though it was going, and Jack Lang knew this better than anybody. He wrote about it in his book, The Big Bust, the, or sorry, The Great Bust, is because of the, w the way the Commonwealth Bank had functioned for its first decade under Dennis and Miller, where it had functioned as a national bank creating credit, um, freaked out the city of London. And Lang writes how uh, when Miller, Dennis and Miller had gone to London after the war had finished and had thrown a great fright into the banking world, by calmly telling a big banker's dinner that the wealth of Australia represented six times the amount that had been borrowed and that the bank could meet every demand because it had the entire capital of the country behind it. The bank had found £350 million for war purposes. Lang said such statements as these caused a near panic in the City of London. <laughs> well, if you take the, uh, the more modern example, Robbie, of the results to the physical economy of the world of the space program. 
Sure. You know, for every cent that was spent, you know, 10 cents was gained in productivity in, in the development of new technology. So you had a net expansion of the physical economy. And that's what the British don't want to happen. Allow the enthusiasm and the creativity of the population to be sponsored by a national bank, good ideas to be funded on the basis that they're good for the general welfare and the development of the economy, and you'll have a massive breakout in wealth that is real, actual de physical development. That's not, what, that's not what the agenda is today. The agenda today through the genocidalist green lobby is to kill off people down to one billion people. It's a deadly fight right now. Yep. All right, and so let's contrast this with a pretty sober picture of the way the current financial system works. Uh, what's that ticking sound? It's the property bomb. Now, I found it funny a couple of weeks ago when the Channel 9 reality show, The Block, bombed <laughs> itself on its last night because it's three of its houses failed to sell at auction. What it showed was the gulf between the hype and the reality. And all they needed to do Channel 9 is watch this publicate, watch, watch this broadcast for the last year. You wouldn't have put that show on. Um, the latest news is that Melbourne property prices have fallen by an average of $33,000 since the beginning of the year. Now it's the sharpest drop in the country, but the whole country is going down. Only little pockets are continuing to rise, such as um, centres of virtual reality known as Cam like Canberra. <laughs> the property market itself is the fuse of the bomb that lies under Australia's financial system. Now you can see this on our website, but I brought it in. Last year we highlighted the case of the Commonwealth Bank. People say to us, how can you say the banks are bankrupt when they're making such big profits? So let's pick on the biggest profit maker of all, the Commonwealth. Uh, Accounting 101, a profit and loss statement is not the same as a balance sheet. You don't determine a the solvency of a, of a company by its profit and loss statement, you determine it by its balance sheet. So we've taken the Commonwealth Bank's balance sheet here and uh, under the accounting rule that assets equals liabilities plus equity, liabilities and equities columns have to add up to assets. But then when you take a realistic view of Commonwealth Bank's assets and realise that 60% of this bank's business is lending into mortgage, lending mortgages into a property market that's super overvalued, way overvalued. You have, and people have, uh, experts have forecast at least a 40% collapse on property prices. If you adjust for that, this bank is absolutely bankrupt. And it's only one of, of the ones that are. Australia's whole banking system is tied up in this. Um, the, everyone in government, in the Reserve Bank, in the system knows that our, how vulnerable our banking system is and every financial decision that, has, that is made is made with a view to propping it up. I'll give you one example that's, a, that's very relevant right now. It's one of the reasons that the, Federal, that the Reserve Bank in Australia is, is doing its best to make sure the dollar remains high, which of course is killing manufacturers, etc is to keep attracting the foreign funds into Australia that invest in the property, and it's probably now the only ones doing it, that uh, to have some kind of demand at least to keep the uh, uh, property bubble up. So it kills the rest of the, the economy, um, apart from mining, but it props up the banks. So uh, Craig, instead of waiting for the inevitable blowout, and that's what it's gonna be inevitable, wouldn't it be better to recognise, A, this is a mess, and reorganise it beforehand with the Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill? Oh, Robbie, the HBPB, the Homeowners and Bank Protection Bill, which people can get on our website, that's only just one part of the problem. The biggest part of the problem right now is the denial of the fact that the entire monetary and financial system is blowing out as we speak. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche, who's you know, known as the world's most accurate forecaster, has made it very clear we've only got weeks, not months, if that, before the, the entire system evaporates under the weight of the speculative debt that's you know, $1.5 uh, quadrillion, dollars, I think the, the amount of debt is in terms of speculative assets that are just literally sinking the physical economy, the real economies of nations. And the looting that's taking place through austerity measures in Europe. You know, Greece, for example, is now borrowing of its own central bank in order to try and find the collateral to pay off its debts. 
So you're getting this cannibalization within their own, their own country to try and prop things up. Bernanke didn't even talk about QE3 at the Jackson Hole meeting recently because, in fact, they're already pumping mm. money into the system as a lender of last resort into Europe. And to talk about that was very politically unsavory for the, uh, for the Obama administration that uh, has been literally in the pay of the uh, bankers for, you know, ever since he's been in the presidency. So the issue comes back to, first of all, uh, the international financial system. And as Mr. LaRouche has pointed out, look, there's, there's only one way of solving this problem is, first of all, for the U.S. to adopt a Glass-Steagall standard, to go back to what Franklin Roosevelt did in 1933 and basically place the entire banking system into a bankruptcy reorganization protect the legitimate parts of the banking system that are required for the economy, but all this speculative Wall Street stuff, charge it back onto the ba balance sheets of the banks and say, that's your responsibility. If they go bust, well, to hell with them. We don't need them. But see, if, well, if the US was to do that, then that will provide the model for all the other countries in the world to introduce their own legislation, which is where our legislation for the HBPB comes in. We would do the same thing, legislate to basically re-regulate the banking system. First of all, protecting the homeowners that, have, that are living in their homes. Now, a lot of these homes are, are completely hyperinflated. Uh, I was stunned on Tuesday uh, on one of the major TV news bulletins that they had a report on the systematic collapse of housing prices. And we talk to our supporters a lot, and we've got the same story coming through. You know, houses that were worth $800,000 are being, being offered for 500000 on this news report, the particular person involved said that housing prices are collapsing at the rate of $800 per week and will continue to do so for the next five years. So that's about $200,000. Yes, this is the property bubble that we've been wa warning about, right? So what this is... I think the five years might be wishful thinking, though. Well, that's true. I mean, because you have an accelerated yeah. uh, problem here. But you think about the people that have you know, blindly gone out and taken uh, extra equity out on the home loans, right? They move into negative equity. What, are we going to have 100,000 people kicked out on the street because of the fact that they've participated, you know, unwisely, of course, in a monetary system which is geared to promote these cheap housing loans, getting people to, you know, through the first homeowners' buy, uh, loans to get into homes, uh, and, you know, way above in their means in many cases. But you can't have 100,000 people on the streets. Right now, there's a 150,000 house deficit, home deficit in Sydney, which has been reported you know, for the next 10 years. Unless we build 150,000 homes, you are going to see the cost of rentals go through the roof. The cost of, of, of housing is going to be completely unaffordable in Sydney. And that's just one state. Look, when LaRouche first proposed the homeowners and bank protection bill in the States, it was just before everything blew up. And if it had been implemented straight away, you, you wouldn't have had this um, massive social uh, upheaval that happened in America with all these people forced out of their homes. We can surely learn from that. Know that that's inevitably where we're going and do this now. Take these steps now. There's no point waiting. No, but that means that the Gillard government is going to have to acknowledge that their policy in government has been wrong. The Liberal Party government under Ab Abbott, if, if it ever becomes a government, is going to have to acknowledge that their monetarist policy is wrong, which means they're going to have to go and explain that to the bankers that are controlling these parties. So therefore, you're talking about actually a revolution in the way that the political system of this country functions, and we are the only ones talking about this. We're the only ones talking about a national bank, and that is, you know, that's what the, the, the public, the viewers are having to look at, is that, okay, well look, you guys are gonna move down the track very shortly into complete chaos, bankruptcy, losing your homes, you know, chaos of a financial disintegration which will bring, the, bring on a new dark age, as Mr. LaRouche has said. We've warned for this for years. Nothing's changed. If you stick with the same parties, that's what's going to happen. So therefore, you have to be a bit bolder and say, well, what are, you know, take a different route. Yep. Look, at what we, look what we stand for and begin to educate yourselves into what actually is required. And, and this literally is for the survival of you know, their families and for the nation. Give up their illusions about money to save their lives. All right, well, that's it for this week's uh, The CEC Report. I want to thank Jeremy Beck again for joining us. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Robbie. Very, very valuable. And thanks, Craig, again.
stay tuned next week for more reports and I urge you if you want to master the history of national banking one of the best sources you can read is our New Citizen from uh, October, November 2009, Defeat the British Empire of Monetarism, where we summarise the history uh, in one place. You can, sorry about the mess. You can also read The Fight for an Australian Republic that Craig talked about last week. You can get those from the CEC. Get off our website or call us on 1800 636 432. So thanks again. Tune in next week for more. Mm -hmm.